I don't go anywhere without my planner. It's a little red notebook, and I use it to keep track of everything I have to do. But no matter how efficient I am with my schedule, I always feel like I'm short on time. And one of my favorite scientific concepts can help explain why. Time affluence is this feeling of whether or not we have enough time to do all of the things that we want to do or have to do. This is Ashley Willens, a professor at Harvard Business School and author of Time Smart, How to Reclaim Your Time and Live a Happier Life. Instead of looking at whether we have objectively sort of enough hours in a day, we're looking at subjectively whether people feel like they have enough time. Time affluence is the opposite of what I experience on a near daily basis. My calendar never feels open. My subjective feeling is one of extreme busyness, what researchers like Ashley have christened time famine. People today are feeling increasingly pressed for time, increasingly time poor, such that they feel like they have too many things to do and not enough time in the day to do it. But Ashley's research has shown that it's taking more of a toll on me than I realize. These feelings of time stress, this time famine, comes at a cost of happiness. In some Gallup World poll data that we analyzed with 2.5 million Americans, we found that this feeling of time famine had a worse impact on happiness than being unemployed. So it seems to have dramatic consequences for our subjective well-being. And it's interesting because there's also this data suggesting that we objectively have more time today than we used to. So subjective feelings of time stress are going up, while the objective amount of time that we have is actually going up as well. You're listening to the shortcast of The Happiness Lab. I'm Dr. Laurie Santos. In this shortcast, you'll learn what's driving your brain to experience time famine, and what actions you can take to feel less alarmed by the clock. So why do we fail to notice the extra minutes we all have each day? The reason, according to science, is that nowadays our free time tends to be broken up into tiny chunks, or time confetti. So we have more time confetti now than we used to. That leisure time is sporadic, it's scattered, because we're constantly connected to our phones, we're trying to do many, many different tasks, and our attention is being pulled in many directions. So this feeling of trying to pack in all of this stuff, being pulled in all these directions during our free time, can make us feel more pressed for time. The problem, though, is that people don't realize the consequences of time poverty are so great And so we constantly make individual choices that make our time famine even worse. People who have more job flexibility, more paid vacations in their workplace are happier with their jobs. They're more satisfied and less likely to leave. But when you ask people, would you rather have job A and job A makes more salary or job B and job B has more paid vacation and less salary, people always go for job A. If you've listened to other episodes of The Happiness Lab, you know that many of us equate happiness with having more money which means that most of us want to work more and more in order to earn more and more. But that trade-off of giving up time for money winds up resulting in less and less time affluence, which often means less and less happiness. It's a pretty stupid strategy, but it's also one that Ashley has found many of us employ all the time. We think that prioritizing money and working a lot is a status symbol. So we think if we seem really busy, that's going to confer us higher status. And it's one of the reasons that we don't focus on time, take paid vacation, and instead focus a lot on working. We have a paper showing that even just this general prioritization of money over time means that we're less likely to interact with a peer. So we spend 18% less time interacting. And we know that these small social moments are some of the happiest in our day. Which raises a big question. How can we fight time poverty? What can people like me do to feel a little more time affluent? One thing that I did structurally in my life is I cut my commute time to basically zero. I pay a lot of money in rent, but I can walk to the office. So I'm not only buying myself time each and every day, but I can also spend that time in ways that are good for happiness, like walking, enjoying the scenery. I take in a lot of sunrises walking across the bridge to work. So Ashley exchanges money in the form of rent for less time wasted on a dull commute. She also uses her other expenditures in the same way. Like house cleaning, grocery delivery. It turns out that allocating more of your available budget to these services can substantially increase your time affluence. 
If you spend money in a typical month to outsource dislike tasks to others, therefore buying back some of your time or at least buying more positive moments, we see that that is a good predictor of happiness for people all across the income spectrum, the richest people that we've studied, people living kind of at or even slightly below the poverty line. And we have some findings suggesting that couples who make a concerted effort to outsource in a typical month experience greater relationship satisfaction because they're less negatively impacted by daily stressors. And that effect on relationship satisfaction is just about as good as having a partner who's a really good listener. <laughs> All this sounds great, but I bet some of you are thinking the same thing I was. Is this a strategy that everyone can use? Or is this just for wealthy Harvard professors who can afford a house cleaner? Ashley says it's less about how much you spend on outsourcing tasks and more about taking notice of it when you do. So we show in some of our studies that some of the happiness benefit of these time-saving purchases that we make on a regular basis, some of that benefit is actually from just thinking that you're saving time and then spending that time in a more deliberate way. So you could even, if you don't want to change the way that you're spending, sit down and look at your purchases that you make in a typical month and say, hey, when I made that takeout purchase, I actually was saving time that I wasn't spending on cooking. What did I do with that time? And next week when I buy that fast food, <laughs> could I be spending that time I would have spent cooking in a better way? So part of the benefit is just removing negative tasks that you don't like. And part of the benefit of time saving is being more deliberate with the free time that you've gained. The idea of being more deliberate with how we think about our time is critical. Remember, time affluence isn't the objective amount of free time you have, the actual number of open blocks in your calendar. It's your subjective sense that you have some free time. And that means you can do a lot to boost your sense of time affluence, even if in reality, you can't really open up that much actual free time. It's just the sense of giving yourself a bit of a break that makes all the difference, even if the amount of time you actually gain is small. In the rare cases when we get free time, we need to use it wisely. This is something I really struggle with because I do get little blasts of free time confetti here and there. There are lots of unexpected changes as an academic. Meetings canceled, talks that wrap up earlier than predicted, appointments with people who never show. I usually use those free moments to do a quick social media check or dig into my email. But Ashley argues that I should plan to use those little time windfalls a lot more effectively. Have you done this in your own life? Are there specific tips you use when you have a meeting canceled or have a small time windfall? Yeah, so I actually have started to keep a time windfall list <laughs> <laughs> of if I have small pockets of five minutes and 10 minutes, what are some life things, not work things, not emails, those will always be there, but some small positive life things that I can do with those windfalls. Send a letter of gratitude, call my mom, <laughs> uh, reach out to a friend from grad school I haven't talked to in a while. And I write those in my agenda. And I don't always get to all of them, but I do get to some of them. And I think that doing this research has made me a little bit more strategic about not squandering the small moments that all of us find ourselves with on a daily basis. I love this solution. It's so awesome that we can counteract this problem of feeling time poor simply by taking advantage of all that time confetti. So instead of letting all those tiny moments slip through my fingers, I'm going to start using them, more like real confetti, to do something memorable and worth celebrating. And to make that easier, I've started keeping a time windfall list myself in my little red planner. Making this episode has caused me to realize that I'm not helping the people I care about by packing my schedule to the brim. Hearing the science has caused me to reflect on the negative impact my time famine is having on the people I care about most. And beyond that, I'm rethinking my belief that there's something morally virtuous about being busy all the time. Leisure shouldn't be a luxury, especially not when it's so connected to our overall well-being. The science shows it doesn't have to cost much, what matters more is being deliberate with our choices. So the next time you make a choice that prioritizes your own happiness, recognize it for what it is, an investment. And investments in time affluence pay phenomenal dividends. 